Hey guys, welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery video. I might want to get yourself comfy for this one because I feel like it's going to be a long one. I've got like 22 pages of notes and we're talking about another serial killer. It's a very interesting case, so I hope you guys enjoy. But before I get into the video, I just want to address something really quickly that I've been talking about on Twitter a little bit and I've been arguing with a few people in the comments of my videos on this topic. And that topic is trigger warnings. And a lot of people are telling me that I need to give trigger warnings for all kinds of things. And here is my stance on it. If you're clicking on a video that is entitled The Murder of Whoever or The Strange Disappearance or like things like that, that is your first clue that the topic I'm talking about isn't best for the most sensitive of people. I'm talking about murder, I'm talking about true crime and unsolved disappearances. These aren't easy things to hear for everyone and I get that but people keep telling me that I need to put trigger warnings at the beginning of my video to say what I'm going to be talking about but the clue is in the title of the video. <laughs> Do you get what I mean? And like I am open to maybe discussion about this but I feel that like people are being a little bit too sensitive because when you're clicking on a video that is entitled the murder of this person or like this video is probably going to be entitled the Texarkana Moonlight Murders or something along that line you kind of know what you're getting into. Um, I also get a lot of people telling me that I need to put in trigger warnings when I'm talking about rape or sexual abuse and of course I understand that but I don't talk about rape or sexual abuse in detail on the channel and I do that for a reason and that it's not always the nicest thing to hear about. I always say if people want to hear more details about something, Google is your friend. So for example, if I am to say trigger warning, I'm about to talk about rape, I'm not going to be talking about rape in detail. I literally say the woman was raped, the woman was sexually abused. I will not talk in detail. So I have a lot of people telling me I need to like say I'm about to talk about rape before I talk about rape, but the, like, the sentence would literally go, Trigger warning, I'm about to talk about rape. The woman was raped. Like, do you get what I mean? I like, it just seems a little bit unnecessary when I don't tend to go into details about this kind of thing. If I was to go into more details, of course I would pre-warn you before I did that, but I rarely, rarely do. And the third one that I get a lot of people telling me to put trigger warnings for, and this one drives me insane, is when I talk about animals dying. And my stance on this one is pretty self-explanatory, I think. If you are more affected by an animal dying than the gruesome brutal murder of a woman that I'm talking about then I feel like it would be insensitive of me in a video to say oh trigger warning I'm about to be talking about a dead animal because I'm already talking about murdered humans do you get what I mean if you're sensitive about an animal dying should you really be watching a video about a human dying and I am open to conversation on it but I do try and be as sensitive as I can in my videos but I cannot preface every single thing that I say with a trigger warning. Do you get what I mean? Like, I'm sure you do. I'm already just waiting for the barrage of hate I'm gonna get for that, but I just feel like it needs to be said. I have addressed it on my Twitter, and I've had some people argue with me about it, but I know where I stand, and I hope you guys are okay with that. So now let's get into the mysteries. So this week we're talking about the Texarkana Moonlight Murders. I am pretty sure that I'm saying Texarkana wrong, but in my accent, if I say Texarkana, Texarkana. It sounds like I'm trying to do a really bad American accent. Texarkana. <laughs> so I'm going to say Texarkana, but I'm very aware that that's probably wrong, so do not jump down my throat. Texarkana? Kana? Can my accent just does not work. <laughs> so throughout the spring of 1946 in Texarkana, Texas, a phantom killer, as he became to be known, started to murder young couples. Throughout the summer of 1946, the entirety of Texarkana lived in fear. They wouldn't leave the house after sundown. They were just in complete lockdown. And it's been many, many years since the murders, but nobody has ever been convicted of them. The attacks all took place on weekends and after dark, like I said, targeting young couples. The first attack took place on Friday, February 22nd, 1946. It's about 11.55pm and 25-year-old Jimmy Hollis and 19-year-old Mary Larry were attacked whilst parked in a secluded lover's lane. It was just outside the city limits, very secluded, quite dark and obviously they'd gone there for some privacy. They'd only arrived about 10 minutes earlier when a man walks up to the driver's side door where Jimmy sat and shines a bright flashlight in his eyes. Jimmy, believing he's been mistaken for somebody else, says, fella, you got me mixed up with someone else. You've got the wrong man. The man is still shining the torch into Jimmy's eyes and is also holding a pistol and replies saying, I don't want to kill you, but do what I say. He ordered both Jimmy and Mary out of the car and they both got out through the driver's side door. 
The man says to Jimmy, take off your fucking britches. So as Jimmy bends down to take off his trousers, he is hit over the head twice with a large blunt object and he's hit so hard that Mary thinks he's been shot because the sound of Jimmy's skull cracking was so loud. Mary then has a brief conversation with the attacker about money. She's basically saying to him that they don't have any money on them and the attacker bends down against Jimmy's wallet out of his trousers and sees that he doesn't have any money. Mary's then knocked to the ground with the same object that was used to attack Jimmy. While she's on the ground the man tells her to get up and run so Mary starts running and the direction in which she's running there's a ditch and the man says to her no don't run that way run up the road so Mary of course starts running up the road as fast as she can. There was an old car parked nearby that Mary ran to for help but there was nobody there so she continues running up the road. Then the man catches up with her and he asks her why she's running and she says because you told me to and then he starts calling her a liar. He knocks her to the ground and sexually assaults her. Now like I said at the beginning of this video not going to go into detail but the the details of this are on Google on the Wikipedia page if you do want to have a read. She manages to get up and is saying to the man, go ahead and kill me. But he doesn't really do anything and she just continues running and he doesn't follow her. She runs half a mile to the nearest house and she gets her attention and they alert the authorities. Obviously by the time the police get there, the attacker is long gone. However, Jimmy's still alive. Jimmy was hospitalised for several days with severe skull fractures. It was fractured in three places but he leaves hospital in the end and he's fine. Mary only spent one night in hospital, she wasn't actually that injured, just very shaken up. Now authorities question Mary over these attacks, but they don't believe that she was actually attacked by a random person. They're basically trying to coerce her into saying that she knew who did this to her, and they kind of thought that Mary and Jimmy were both protecting the man who did this because it was somebody they both knew. I'm sure at one point the police were probably thinking that Jimmy was the one who attacked Mary and Mary had hurt Jimmy and they both came up with a story to like protect themselves um, but either way they did not believe them. Now Jimmy and Mary both gave very different descriptions of the man that attacked them because like I said Jimmy had a torch flash right into his eyes so he was kind of blinded. Mary said that the man was wearing a white mask with cutouts for the eyes and lips however Jimmy never even noticed the man was wearing a mask because obviously he was blinded and because of this their descriptions were so different. They did both say he was about six foot but Jimmy said that it was a very tanned white man, but Mary said it was a light-skinned black man. Obviously, like I said, the man was wearing a white mask, so I can imagine it was quite difficult to like figure out what he actually looked like underneath. So that was the first attack, and the police didn't really think much of it. They thought that Mary was just like trying to cover something up. They didn't look into it too much. It was only one month later, on the 24th of March 1946, where two people were found dead. Richard Griffin, who's 29, and Polly Ann Moore, 17, were found dead on another lover's lane. Again, the road was just outside of city limits. It was a road that at the time was called Rich Road. And their bodies were found by a passerby between about 8 and 9 a.m. And the passerby first thought they were just both asleep in the car. They actually went over to see and realised that they were dead. Now Richard and Polly were last seen the night before about 10pm. So they could have been attacked any time between the thought about 11 and 8am. Now the scene here sounded like it was gruesome, horrible, so much blood. Richard was found between the front seats of the car and he was kind of like in the fetal position. He was on his knees, his head was resting in his hands. His pockets were turned inside out like somebody had gone through them. Polly was laying face down on the back seat, her purse lying next to her. Both had been shot in the back of the head and blood stains on the ground outside of the car actually suggested that they'd both been shot outside of the car, then whoever had done it had put them in the car, which makes the sort of position of Richard's body even that more creepy because it's like somebody has kind of put him down, maybe it looked like he was praying, it, it's just a very weird thought. Now I couldn't get the facts 100% on this but a couple of reports said that Polly was actually shot on a blanket in front of the car but there was also another report that said another blanket had been used as a kind of muffler for the gun. They had both been shot with a 32 caliber revolver. Of course the bodies were taken to a local hospital for an autopsy and they did a standard autopsy but obviously they'd both been shot in the head, their cause of death was pretty obvious. However there was a mix up between the hospital and the funeral home and the bodies were actually picked up 
before they could confirm if Polly had been sexually assaulted or not. Now it was at this point that the police really started to sort of take notice and thought maybe there was a serial offender in town and they started to do a really thorough investigation. Now there had been rain overnight so any footprints that would have been in the area had been completely washed away. There was obviously a lot of blood at the scene. I read a report that said there was so much blood it was like dripping out of the bottom of the car. It's like thick congealed old blood and like just that image is so kind of disturbing there's just there's so much blood so the police start to bring in suspects they start to question people they put out a 500 dollars reward which obviously back in those days in 1946 was a lot more money than 500 dollars would be today but even though there was so much blood you would think that the killer would possibly put a finger in it and maybe leave a fingerprint but there wasn't anything really there about three weeks later now saturday 13th of april 1946 a 15 year old girl called Betty Jo Booker is playing saxophone with her band, the Rhythm Airs. They had a weekly slot playing at a club and it finished about 1.30 a.m. And so Betty had a friend actually visiting from out of town, Paul Martin, she'd known him for years. And they organized after Betty was finished, Paul was gonna come and pick her up and drop her at a slumber party the other side of town. Paul and Betty were killed anytime from 1.30 a.m. to 6.30 a.m. that morning. Paul's body was found about 6.30 a.m. by a family who contacted the authorities immediately. Paul was found lying on the side of the road and he'd been shot four times. He'd been shot once in the nose, in his left fourth rib from behind, his right hand and the back of his neck. And it was quite clear that he'd put up a fight here. Like any sort of wounds in the hand is always an indication that he's defended himself. So he's clearly like putting up a fight, putting his hand out, maybe turning around trying to run away, which is why he's been shot in the back. And obviously it hasn't worked out for him because he was murdered. Now Betty's body wasn't found until 11.30 a.m. and she was about two miles away from where Paul was found. She was found lying on her back fully clothed and she'd been shot twice. Again, she'd been shot through her left ribs and also through her left cheek. Both of them had been shot with a 32 caliber pistol. Now Betty had been raped, but at the time this wasn't made public news, this was 1946, you didn't talk about that kind of thing. But it did come out years later that Betty was raped. Same as in the first attack on Mary, that wasn't made public until many years later. Now authorities couldn't find Paul's car and eventually they did find it about 3 miles away from Betty, but about 1.5 miles away from Paul. So this is a very strange sort of crime scene. Um, like, did the murderer move the car, or did Betty and Paul really put up a fight and run away as far as they can before the murderer found them? Was it kind of like a hunting situation? Did he maybe just abduct Betty and take her to another secluded location before, like, assaulting her? It's just a very strange, like, scene here. Something the police very much focused on in this case was Betty's saxophone. Now obviously Betty had been playing her saxophone with the band, she would have had it on her and people confirmed that when she left she 100% had this saxophone. But the police couldn't find it anywhere so this became a massive point in the investigation. They put so much manpower into finding this saxophone. Now obviously at this point the police finally sort of say yeah we've got a serial killer on our hands. Now the city police were kind of a bit out of their depths, like they, kind of, they knew what they were doing but it was just something that you'd never seen before. So they call in the Texas Rangers and the man put in charge of the case is Texas Ranger Captain Gonzalez. Captain Gonzalez had a lot of experience in the police force. He'd dealt with so many things and he actually said that the murders were among the most puzzling cases that he'd ever encountered in 30 years. There was very, very little evidence here. Like there was pretty much no evidence whatsoever. The police were bringing in suspects left, right and center, but nothing was coming through. Now the media and the authorities worked very closely together in this case. Before the media printed anything, they checked with the authorities that it was okay. The media purposely held back things that the police could use in their investigation. And Captain Gonzalez was very popular with the media, especially female reporters, because he was a very good looking, tall, authoritative Spanish man. The female reporters really latched onto him and they listened to his every word, which is I think part of why this case became such a media sensation because everyone wanted to talk to Captain Gonzalez. The city was gripped with fear at this point. Everyone was totally on edge. Police were roaming the streets 24 seven and gun and hardware sales absolutely soared. People wanted to protect their houses. They were buying dead bolts. They were buying metal sheets to put over their windows even though at this point the killer had never struck anyone in a house. Everyone was still totally on edge. 
And of course, it's America. Gun sales absolutely soared. But ironically, this actually led to more murders. People were so on edge that people were just shooting each other in the streets for making each other jump. I read a story about a man walks into a bar. Maybe he walked in out of hours. I'm not really sure. But the barman just shot him just because he walked into the store outside opening hours. And this wasn't really helped by Captain Gonzalez, who was actually reported saying, oil up your guns, do not use them unless it's necessary, but if you believe it is, do not hesitate. Which, when people are already on edge, you've now got permission from the captain to shoot people if you believe they're the phantom killer. It was just a bit of a mess. Local businesses obviously lost customers. Everyone wanted to be in their houses at night. Nobody wanted to go out in the dark. So local businesses, restaurants, shops, they all started to lose customers. Even the liquor stores started to close by 9.30 p.m. And they actually put a statement in the paper explaining why they started to close. And it was, we fully understand the state of mind in which Texarkana is now gripped and we are selling no liquor to people who have been drinking. We do not wish to add further to the troubles of the police. A voluntary midnight curfew was put in place by the police. Not that most people needed prompting to be in the house, like everyone was gonna be inside anyway, but the police sort of made this a thing. Like I think I said earlier, over 400 people were investigated by the police. I'm not sure how much investigation, like investigated means, but I think it means at least 400 people were brought in for questioning. However, teenagers, they have had no fear and they started to take matters into their own hands at this point. They started arming themselves and purposely parking their cars in the dark on lovers lanes, just waiting for the phantom killer to strike. One night a patrolling officer sees a car parked in a secluded area, so walks up to it to check what's going on. He introduces himself to the teenage girl sat in the driver's seat and says, aren't you scared to be parked out here at night? And she replies, you're the one who ought to be scared, mister. It's a good job you told me who you are. And then he realizes that she's had a pistol pointed at him the entire time. Police obviously warned teenagers against doing this and said to them not to take matters into their own hand, but then they kind of took a leaf out of their book and started to use teenage decoys themselves in their investigation. And the police would take the sons and daughters of the Texas Rangers and sit them in cars and then surround them with police officers just waiting for the phantom killer to strike. And of course he never did. Now the final attack happens on May 3rd. Katie and Virgil Starks are a married couple and this is where the MO of the killer slightly changes. They lived in an isolated farmhouse a few miles outside of Texarkana. They're in the countryside of Miller County and they live on a 500 acre farm. It was just before 9pm and Virgil and Katie are getting ready to go to bed. Katie's upstairs in bed and Virgil is downstairs sitting in his favourite armchair, reading a newspaper, listening to the radio, I think as he did every night. Now Katie's laying in bed when she hears a sound of glass smashing downstairs and just believing her husband's broken something, she goes downstairs to see if he needs any help. Now a couple of minutes before she hears the glass smashing, she's already heard something outside as she shouts down to her husband to turn the radio down to just see what was outside but it didn't really come to anything. Um, so she goes downstairs and sees Virgil sort of stand up in his armchair before slumping back down and she runs over to him, lifts up his head and realises he is dead. He's been shot in the head. Through the closed window he's had two shots fired into the back of his head and it, what's very strange here is that Katie didn't hear the sound of gunshots, but she did hear the glass breaking, which is a bit of a clue for the police in terms of what kind of gun may have been used in this case. Now, this is a strong woman and you are going to be amazed when you hear about what she went through. Um, So Katie runs to the phone and of course, it's one of those old style wall crank phones. So you've got to crank it a certain number of times to get through to the operator and then you get transferred through to the police. Um, it's not like it is nowadays. You can just type 999 and you're done or 911 if you're American. So Katie runs the phone and she only manages to crank twice before she shot herself. Now she shot directly in the face twice. She is shot once in the right cheek and it sort of exits just below her left ear here. So imagine the shot sort of like goes directly through like that. And the other shot goes right in below her lip. It shatters her jaw and the bullet lodges itself underneath her tongue and she has got teeth splintered everywhere. But this doesn't knock her down. She starts to run. So she starts to run towards the living room where she's got her own gun, but she can't see it because at this point she is completely blinded by blood. So she can hear the killer trying to break through the back door. He's sort of struggling and he can't get through. So she runs up to the bedroom where she attempts to leave a note. Imagine that, you've been shot in the face, your husband's dead. 
and you try and leave a note. Like, this woman was amazing. But as she's writing the note, she hears that the killer's managed to get in. He's managed to break in through the window in the kitchen. So Katie runs. She runs through the house and escapes through the front door. And she actually runs to her neighbor's house. And her neighbor is her sister and her brother-in-law. She runs up to the house, she's banging, but there's nobody there. So she runs to a different neighbor. Now at this point, I don't know what the killer's doing. Does the killer not realize that Katie's left the house or does he just like give up and run away? I'm not too sure. Luckily, the second neighbor she runs to is in and she knocks on the door and they open. And she just gasps, Virgil's dead before collapsing in a heap on the floor. So the neighbors call another neighbor who have a car and the other neighbors drive her to the hospital. And whilst Katie's in the car, she actually reaches into her mouth. And obviously, like I said, all her teeth are coming out. She's been shot in the jaw. And she pulls out a tooth with a gold filling and gives it to the driver as payment for taking her to the hospital. Like she's just like reached into her mouth and just pulled out a tooth and is like, here, have this. What? Now at this point she has lost a lot of blood but she's still sort of semi-conscious and at no point does her heart rate change, does she go into shock. She is like Wonder Woman. Of course Virgil died but Katie survived and she actually goes on to remarry and lives a full life. When the authorities arrived at her house they say that it's one of the most disgusting crime scenes they've ever seen. Obviously, Virgil's dead. Um, there was differing opinions of where Virgil was. Some police officers say he was still in his chair when they found him. Some people say he'd slumped forward onto the floor. Um, but their house has actually begun to set on fire. Virgil had like an electric seat warmer and the seat warmer had lit a fire and the entire place was just full of smoke. As well as the smoke, there was a trail of blood. Gonzalez said it was like a river. There was so much blood that he was shot that Katie didn't die. And in the blood, there were Katie's teeth. Now this murder is possibly darker than the others because it was so pre-planned. I think it's quite like fair to think that in all the other murders in the Lover's Lane, the killer's just been sort of like waiting for somebody to drive past and has then attacked. But this one was pre-planned. Whoever attacked them knew where Virgil would sit in the night. I'm guessing he had his routine every night. He'd sit in his armchair and read the newspaper. So he waited by the window and knew where to shoot him in the head. And the killer also knew to wait there for Katie to come down to see what was going on and then knew to shoot her too. The MO here is very different from all of the others, but according to the police, they kind of had no doubt in their mind that it was the same guy. I am a little bit iffy here. I, I don't think it's a given that it was definitely the phantom killer that did this, possibly a copycat. Um, but I, it is also very likely that it is. This was 1940s. There wasn't much crime and especially murder that happened around the area at that time. And in this one, the killer left behind clues. Now in this one, they found the bullets and the actual caliber was different to the bullets used or gun used in all the other murders. The others was always a 32 caliber pistol. In this one, it was a 22 caliber. Again, something else which doesn't directly link the murder to the other ones, but it's still very possible according to the police. They actually found the flashlight, the torch. I feel really weird saying flashlight is a torch to me. They found the torch under the window in the hedge where, from which Virgil had been shot. And the torch was one that wasn't very popular in the area in Texarkana, Texas at the time. There had only been a very limited number of them sold. And they also found bloody footprints and smudged fingerprints. Um, the bloody footprints were anywhere between size 9.5 to 10.5. And, and the fingerprints, they were definitely there, but they were smudged. They couldn't really take much from them. Also, I don't think I said this earlier. I think I forgot. But they also found fingerprints in the Betty Jo and Paul Martin murder as well. Now, nothing at all was taken from the house. So the motive here wasn't robbery. And in all of the other murders... I think the killer wanted it to seem like the motive was robbery, like by turning the pockets inside out, asking for the wallet. And the killer didn't seem that bothered by the money in the other killing. Maybe they just used it as a kind of red herring. I don't think robbery was the motive in any of these. Our towns were brought in by the police and they managed to trace two very significant trails here. One trail to the near highway and one trail back. It is believed that the route followed to where the car was parked on the highway that the killer would have escaped in. And this actually links to the biggest lead that came through in this case. A 33 year old officer called Max Tackett actually realized that on the night of each murder, 
A vehicle was stolen, but also another recently stolen vehicle we found abandoned. This is a very significant point, but we'll talk about why it was significant in a little bit. Around this time, something else happened as well. It was six months after Betty Jo Booker and Paul Martin had been found dead. And Betty Jo's saxophone is finally found. Now, bear in mind, I said that so much police time and effort was put into finding the saxophone. It was actually found less than about 150 steps away from where Betty Jo's body was found. It seemed that Betty Jo had just sort of thrown her saxophone and it had been lost in the growth. A man had even been arrested and made one of the prime suspects in this case because he had walked into a pawn shop and had inquired about selling a saxophone but the man he inquired to said that he seemed very like suspicious and a little bit on edge and very nervous about the saxophone and he didn't actually have the sax with him when he walked into the shop and the shopkeeper contacted the police about it the police chased this man down and when they found this man the man actually had a bag of bloody clothes which is obviously very suspicious in a case like this the police question him and the man says that he just got into a bar fight and he'd been beaten up and all of the blood and the clothes was his own blood um and they please the police actually never found a saxophone so it's still very strange as to why he was inquiring about selling one when he never had one um and he was a prime suspect in this case for quite a while until the police realized actually probably wasn't him in the end the saxophone was just hidden in the bushes it was found by i think it was in somebody's garden i think don't quote me on that um and when they found it the saxophone was kind of like rusted and the case was disintegrated literally when they picked up the case was like falling apart so it is a possibility maybe that the saxophone was placed there later um which is why the police didn't find it at first but from the deterioration of the case it's likely it was there the entire time so who was the phantom killer gonzalez said that it was a shrewd criminal who left no stone unturned to conceal his identity and activities and the police believed that the killer's motive was sex mania. They thought that all he wanted in these cases was to murder the men and sexually assault the women. I also think it's very likely, as in with the Zodiac case I did a couple of weeks ago, that the person who did this had been scorned by love. He attacked couples and couples only. So it's very likely that at some point he had been hurt by most likely a female. He was most likely between 30 and 50 years old. He also likely led a normal life outside of the killings. A good citizen, possibly even had a family who had no idea what was going on. The only physical description in this case came from Hollis and Larry from the first attack. And they gave very differing descriptions. The only thing the police could really get from it is that he was about six foot tall. And of course, there were many false confessions. There was a quite funny false confession about a guy in a bar talking to an undercover reporter. And the reporter says to the guy that if he confessed all, then he would buy him a fifth of whiskey. So the guy does, the guy confesses all, the reporter contacts the police, the police come, like they turn up. And the police are like, we've already arrested this guy. He's like a raging alcoholic and he would do anything for some free alcohol. And when the police speak to the guy and say like, we know you didn't do it. He says, well, hell, I got a fifth of whiskey out of it. There were more false confessions as well. So many people came forward for whatever reason, but the police always knew who it was and who it wasn't. Because like I said earlier, the media held back a lot of details about this case. So it was details only the police knew. And so this was kind of the police's bargaining chip in this case. They kind of like knew that they had the killer if the killer came and confessed and could only tell them these things. But the details would just never align and people could only ever tell them what had featured in the newspaper. After Richard and Polly's murder, the police arrested three different people because they found bloody clothes. All three of the people had alibis, they weren't considered suspicious. Um, there was also a taxi driver that was seen near the vicinity of where one of the murders had happened. And this taxi driver was the prime suspect for a long time just because he was near there. Um, obviously, turns out the taxi driver didn't do it either. But the police did have some serious suspects they looked into. Um, across from one of the murders, the police found fresh tyre tracks. And they traced these tyre tracks to an African-American man who had, I'm not sure how many tyres that would have been back in those days, but they actually managed to trace the tyres to the exact right man. Um, and they arrested him. He did a polygraph test and he failed. And the police like were like, this has to be the guy. He failed the polygraph test. But they weren't convinced. The psychiatrist they took him to was like, this guy is innocent. He's not a murderer. So the psychiatrist hypnotised him. Now the police weren't convinced the guy was actually hypnotised. So what they did to test was they actually put out a lit cigarette on his arm. And the guy didn't flinch. He didn't react to it at all. In the end, the guy confessed that the reason he failed the polygraph test was because he was nervous. 
and he was nervous because he had been having an affair with a married woman. Now, like I said, this is back in the 1940s and a black man having an affair with a married woman, the stakes were so much higher than you could ever imagine nowadays. Like just having an affair nowadays is a bad thing, but back in the 1940s, a black man having an affair with a married woman was just, this guy was so scared. So he lied in the polygraph test. I think in his head, he was thinking, what would he prefer to go down for, murder? or known to be having an affair with a married woman. Now his affair with a married woman was his alibi for that night. He went to see her, then as he was driving home, he stopped on the side of the road to urinate, which is why the tire tracks were there, and then he drove home. In the end, the police kind of like put their hands up and were like, yeah, this isn't the guy. The next one is a man called Ralph B. Bowman. Now this was May 1946, and an ex-army Air Force veteran walks into a police station in Los Angeles and, and says, I'm the guy who killed all the people in Texarkana. He spins this tale of how he's been in a coma for the last few weeks and he's woken up and his rifle's disappeared and he's got this feeling that he's running away from something. Therefore, he must be the killer. He kind of resembled the description. He was six foot, he was like, fairly dark skinned, he could have been it. The police agreed that it was possible, but they had zero evidence to go on. And they found out that the guy was actually discharged from the army the year before in 1945 for being psychoneurotic. He was an expert shot, he would hit bullseye every single time. And there were, there were things to go on here, like it could have been him. But they sent all this guy's details to Gonzalez and whilst Gonzalez said that the guy was certainly a mental case, there was no evidence what to, whatsoever to suggest that he was the phantom killer. There's no evidence to, to suggest that he was ever even in Texas. It just didn't all match up. Another possible suspect is a German prisoner of war. So this guy was announced as a suspect on May 8th, shortly after Katie and Virgil Starks were murdered. Now this guy, his name was never released, but he was a stocky 24 year old. He was about 180 pounds. He had brown hair, blue eyes, and he had recently escaped from prison. Now around the same time this guy escaped, there was a car stolen in Arkansas and the same guy attempted to buy ammunition across loads of stores in Oklahoma. Soon after this, in East Texas, a 45 year old man called Herbert Thomas was flagged down by a hitchhiker. Now the hitchhiker gets in the car and Herbert said he wouldn't usually have stopped for hitchhikers but the guy sort of spun this really sad tale about his, how his mum was terminally ill, he had to go see her and he needed a ride to Henderson and he offered $5 for this which back in those times was quite a lot of money. So they drive towards Henderson and as they reach Henderson the guy pulls out a pistol, points it at Herbert's head and tells him to keep driving and he tells him how he would kill him like he killed the five people in Texarkana, how he killed Betty Jo Booker and Paul Martin, he mentioned them specifically by name. He said that he was not done killing and he was planning more and he would kill Herbert if Herbert didn't do what he said. So they kind of just drive back to where Herbert first picked this guy up and the guy gets out of the car and that's kind of it. The guy took back the five dollars and also took an extra three dollars from Herbert as well and that's pretty much it. Um, it's a very suspicious thing, there's actually no evidence whatsoever to link this guy to the phantom murders, but it, I guess it's a possibility this guy is saying he did it, that's about it, but yeah. The next one is a guy called H.B. Tennyson, or he was known by nickname Doody. So Tennyson was a 18 year old college student and he was found dead from cyanide poisoning. Now days before he'd gone into a shop and bought this poison himself so there was no doubt there was suicide and not murder. He'd said in the shop how he wanted to use it to kill rats but obviously he had different intentions. He was found dead in his bed on November 5th 1948 and a suicide note was found near his body but it was very strange. The suicide note was found inside of a fountain pen on the tip of the pen was cyanide. Now the note contained a clue to the combination of a lockbox, but the police didn't bother figuring out the combination and going through all the clues, it just kind of broke the box open. And in the box they found a stack of papers and several rolls of film of like Mexico. And underneath the stack of papers they found a note confessing to the Texarkana murders. The note says, why did I take my own life? Well, when you committed two double murders, you would too. Now the police were immediately a bit dubious because at the time Tennyson would have only been 16. He was extremely shy, he didn't have many friends and he actually went to the same school as Betty Jo Booker and even played in the band with her. They weren't friends, they just sort of 
were in the same school. But when police searched his room, they also found loads of other letters as well. They found like so many like drafts, none of them had dates, they didn't know in which order they were written. But they did find one note that said, please disregard all other messages which I have written. They are only thoughts which I was thinking about as possible reasons for taking my own life. Now, I don't know about you guys here. I do not think Tennyson is a viable suspect here. I think he was too young. I think he was just sad and shy, didn't have any friends and just wanted to end his life, but wanted a reason, a reason to do so. I don't think he wanted to just kill himself and kind of like let his family down. Maybe he was mentally ill and maybe in his head he thought that if he confessed to the killings, his family wouldn't blame him for killing himself. Does that make sense? Now a friend of Tennyson called James Freeman actually came forward to the police and said that there was no way that Tennyson could have been the murderer because on the night the Starks died, they were actually together. They were both round Tennyson's house, like playing games, cards, checkers, and they were together when they heard the news about the Starks murder. There was no way it was possible. But the police did carry on looking into it anyway, and then they realised that his fingerprints didn't match the fingerprints found at the scene. Although saying that, the fingerprints found at the scene of Betty and Paul's murder, they're thought to be the murderers. They might not even be the murderers, they might just be some random fingerprints. So it's a very loose fingerprint match thing that they would get. Okay, now let's talk about the prime suspect here. The prime suspect is a man called Yoel Swinney. And this is the suspect that came from Tackett's abandoned car theory. Theory that every night a car would be stolen, an abandoned car would show up. Um, so on Friday, June 28th, 1946, Tackett found a car in a car park that had been reported stolen. So he stakes out, he just waits, and eventually a 21-year-old woman returns to the car and he immediately arrests her. The woman was called Peggy Swinney. She explained that she'd been newly married to a man called Yoel Swinney and that the car had been stolen by him. He was currently in Atlanta trying to sell another stolen car. So Tackett contacts Atlanta PD and Atlanta PD confirm that they have actually had a man recently come in and report that a guy had been trying to sell stolen goods to him. So Tackett travels to Atlanta and he talks to the citizen and the citizen says that he actually probably wouldn't recognise the guy if he saw him again. But Tackett Tackett knows that if the guy saw the citizen again, then the guy would probably actively try and avoid him. So Tackett kind of says to the guy, let's just like walk around together and see if anything suspicious comes up. So that's what they do, they start to walk around to public places, places that Tackett kind of knew that Yoel Swinney would be. And it works out. So one day the two of them walk into Arkansas Motor Coach bus station. It's a Saturday and as they walk in a man looks shocked and runs out of the back of the building. Tackett runs after him and apprehends this guy on a fire escape. The man was Yoel Swinney. And when Tackett approaches him the man says don't shoot me and Tackett's like I'm not going to shoot you for stealing cars. And Yoel says Mr. Don't play games with me. You want me for more than stealing cars. And so Yoel is put into the back of a police car and there's another police officer in there called Johnson and Johnson's talking to Yoel and Yoel says, Mr. Johnson, you got me for more than stealing cars. So whilst Tackett's got Yoel in Arkansas, Peggy Swinney starts talking back in Texas. So Peggy Swinney basically confesses to everything her husband's done. She knows details about these murders that nobody else knows and that haven't been released to the public. And when she finds out that her husband's been arrested for potential murder, she exclaims, how did they find it out? There's no shock, it's just, how did they find it out? She also takes the police officers to where Paul Martin's body was found and says that whilst Paul Martin was being killed, she was hiding in the woods. And actually the police did find woman's heel prints in the woods at that time. Swinney never denied anything or pled his innocence, he just remained completely tight-lipped, which is kind of an admission of guilt, I suppose. I mean, like, if you really hadn't done it, you kind of argue your case and be like, I'm not a serial killer, I haven't killed five people. As a decent person probably would do. He had owned a 32 caliber gun, but he'd recently sold it, and he also had a work shirt found in his house. And apparently when the work shirt was sort of shone under black light, it had the word Stark written on it. Sounds like damning evidence, doesn't it? Like it's, it sounds like you can't really argue with this. However, Peggy actually recanted her entire confession, said she'd made it all up. And because the laws at the time, they couldn't make Peggy stand trial and say anything against her husband. So they kind of had to just leave it there. Yoel couldn't be convicted for murder, but they did put him away, I think for 20 years for car theft. So. Regardless, this guy went to prison for a long time anyway. 
Now police worked day and night trying to confirm Peggy's story, but they could never actually confirm it. She said a whole lot of things, but the police could never confirm any of it. And I think in the end they confirmed that when the Starks were murdered, the Swinneys weren't even in the area, they were in San Antonio. Yol Swinney is definitely the most likely suspect here, without a doubt, but the, the police don't really have much to go on. They don't have any evidence. I don't think they could convict anyone based on the evidence they have unless they have a bulletproof confession here. It's likely that Peggy Swinney said what she said for attention. Maybe between the two of them, the Swinneys had come up with a story. Maybe they were both not the most mentally stable people, just liked attention. Or, I don't know, maybe they were convinced they did it and they didn't. Or maybe they did actually do it. So Yol Swinney is the most likely suspect here. I know there have been books written on the fact that it was 100% Yol Swinney. Very likely. But we don't know that. Now I'm sure you're thinking, like I was thinking throughout my research of this, there are a lot of similar links to the Zodiac. Could the Zodiac and the Phantom Killer be the same person? It's unlikely here. Their MO was very similar, young couples on lovers lanes. However, the Zodiac never sexually assaulted any of the women. He just liked to murder them. It's very possible that the Zodiac was, let's say, inspired by the killings of the Phantom Killer. It was kind of a copycat thing and nobody made the connection at the time. However, based on the predicted age of the Zodiac, people said he was sort of between sort of let's say late 20s, early 30s, if the Phantom Killer was the same person, he would have been under 10 years old at the time, which isn't looking likely, is it? Yes, they've got the predicted age of the Zodiac completely wrong, which is possible. They've recently convicted the Golden State Killer, East Area Rapist, original Night Stalker, whatever you want to know him as, and turns out that he was a hell of a lot younger than they thought he would be. Nowadays in Texarkana, there are no murders. The murders just kind of stopped and they don't know why. On the 7th of May, 1946, a man was found dead on a train track and they kind of just assumed it was suicide or an accident. The guy had ended up on the train track. His left arm and left leg had been completely severed by a freight train going over it. Um, but the coroner actually said that the man had been murdered somewhere else and be put on the train tracks. There was a severe lack of blood at the train tracks, as you would expect if somebody has had their limbs cut off. Police said that this was stupid and he it was obviously a suicide. A lot of people did start to think that this guy was the killer, that this guy had murdered himself and that's why the killing stopped. Or maybe this guy was another victim of the killer. It's a very loose link, but that was a very prominent rumour at the time. Now the city have moved past the killings. Every year on Halloween, they play The Town That Dreaded Sundown, a 1976 movie that depicted the events, and people flock to it. Every year there's like over 500 people that go to see this outdoor showing of the movie. And it's kind of just a myth, an urban legend, but these were real people and they did die. And I don't think we're ever gonna find out who did it because there is no damning evidence whatsoever. And that is everything I have on this case. Congratulations if you've managed to sit through this very long video. If you have sat through, then I think this definitely deserves a thumbs up. And if you're not subscribed, then subscribe to my channel and I will see you in the next one, guys. Bye.